Now, before we begin, we just wanted to let you know that we've got two brand new documentaries up on our Patreon page, Unit 731, and a Murderous Minds episode on John Wayne Gacy. To not only show your support for the channel, but also get access to all of our exclusive documentaries, then head over to Patreon and join. It'll be the best $2 you've spent all month. And now, hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. Richard Lee McNair was born on the 19th of December, 1958, in southwest Oklahoma. He was the eldest of four sons, born to James and Willany McNair. The family moved around a lot, but eventually settled in Duncan, in Stevens County, Oklahoma, where James eventually ended up being a detective and deputy sheriff. Richard's childhood was good. He was close to his mother and brothers, and they were all brought up to be respectful, hardworking boys. When Richard left school, he worked a number of different jobs, from construction to working at a radio station as a radio announcer and DJ. As a result, he could turn his hand to anything. Later, he started selling cars, something he was good at, as he had charm and charisma. At the age of 19, Richard moved 10 miles away to Edmond, where he enrolled at Central State University to study criminal justice. But he quit after just six months and went back to selling cars. In 1980, 21-year-old Richard married his 19-year-old childhood sweetheart, Dorothy. By this time, Richard had a keen interest in guns, and it was usual for him to be carrying a weapon. Dorothy wanted children, but Richard was so opposed to the idea that he had a vasectomy. During the marriage, Richard had his first serious brush with the law when he was arrested for stealing a car and setting fire to it. Not surprisingly, the marriage only lasted a year and a half. In 1982, Richard tried to put his criminal past behind him and joined the Air Force. He trained as a security specialist in the military police and also received anti-terrorist training. All this would come in very handy later in his life. After training, Richard was posted to Minot, North Dakota. Initially, he enjoyed the nightlife of Minot and partied hard, but he found alcohol was upsetting his stomach and he stopped drinking in 1983 and turned his thoughts to getting fit instead. For several years, Richard had a clean record in the Air Force and was often commended for the undercover work he did and always scored highly in his reviews. However, in 1987, he got into a fight at a party and damaged his hand that left a nasty scar, something that would come back to haunt him later in life. After the fight, Richard's military career started to fall apart. He was found with stolen goods and although he was eventually found not guilty, the incident tainted his record. Years later, he confessed he was indeed guilty of the theft. After the incident, he was demoted from being a highly ranked security specialist to an infantry clerk. By this time, Richard was burgling businesses on a regular basis. He wasn't stealing large amounts, but the impact on those he burgled would have been immense. It's strange, as he didn't really need the money. He was well paid as an airman, and he seemed to be robbing for kicks. He just hoarded the stuff he stole and didn't sell it. Things changed on Tuesday, 17th of November, 1987, when Richard broke into an office at the Farmers Union Elevator Company in Minot. As he tried to open the safe, he took a bathroom break. He was suffering from diarrhea and urgently needed to go. While he walked back to the safe, he heard a semi-truck pull up outside the office. It was driven by 47-year-old Jerry Thies. He also heard the door to the office being unlocked. 31-year-old Dick Kisman, a father of two had arranged to meet Jerry at the office to help him with the load. He had no idea what was about to happen as he opened the door. Dick made his way up the small flight of stairs to the landing and he immediately knew something wasn't right. The security gate that should have been shut was open. What he didn't notice, however, was the dangling wires from the wall switch that operated the gate. What he could see was a small duffel bag, although he thought nothing of it. The bag belonged to Richard, and amongst other items, it contained a five-shot, low-velocity, 38 Smith & Wesson Special. As Dick switched on the lights, he didn't notice Richard until a gunshot aimed at the back of his head pierced the glass door next to him. The shot missed but left him with a graze just below his right ear. Dick fell to the floor screaming in terror, and as he lay there, Richard walked up to him and fired four shots into his body. 
A couple of them missed, but blood gushed out from the wounds to his arm and leg. Dick pretended to be dead. Richard mistakenly believed he was the driver of the truck he had heard pull up outside. Believing he wouldn't be disturbed further, he shut the lights off and left the office. As Dick lay bleeding on the floor, he prayed that Jerry had heard the gunshots and drove off to get help. Sadly, he hadn't. He was still sitting in his cab with the radio on, eating ice cream and sipping soda. At 10.04pm, when Dick thought the gunman had gone, he made a frantic 911 call. As Dick talked on the phone to 911, he suddenly heard shots from outside. Richard shot Jerry four times through the truck window from a distance of about 15 foot. Jerry was killed instantly from shots to his head, neck and shoulder. He was found still clutching his ice cream tub. Dick survived the attack, but was left badly injured and traumatized. The irony is that Richard returned home and later his girlfriend came over. She was a nurse who had been on duty when the injured Dick was brought in. She had no idea her kind loving boyfriend was responsible. The police moved quickly to find the gunman. They were in no doubt that the person was responsible for a spate of breaking and entries over the past year and believed it was the same man that shot and killed Jerry. They believed they were looking for a cold-blooded, antisocial killer with no guilt or remorse. However, three months after the murder, they appeared no closer to catching the perpetrator. The breakthrough came when the storage unit Richard rented tried to retrieve payment for the rent owed. After several unsuccessful attempts to contact him, they finally decided to recoup their losses by selling whatever was being kept in the unit. When they opened it using bolt cutters, they were shocked to find it stuffed with stolen carpets. Richard had rented the storage unit in the name of Lee Richards, and after items with links to the airbase in Minot were found, it didn't take long to realize the man hiring the storage was Richard Lee McNair. The pieces of the jigsaw started to come together. Richard was known to the police, not as a criminal, but through his work undercover for the Air Force. On the 16th of February, 1988, he was asked to go to the police station on the pretense of doing some undercover work for them. He drove himself to the station, having no idea that he was in fact going to be questioned about what they had found in his storage locker. After just a few questions, it became apparent that Richard had something to hide and he asked for a lawyer. He was also searched, and a 380 all all-too-loading pistol was found in his jacket pocket. Shortly after, Richard was arrested. As he sat, handcuffed to a chair, after being left alone for a short time, Richard used lip balm to help slide the cuff off one of his hands, and he made a run for it. As the stunned officers ran after him, he made his way out of the building. Richard grabbed a coat from a coat rack, and to his amazement, there were a set of Lincoln car keys in the pocket. As he reached the car park and scanned for a Lincoln car, he was astonished that the first one he tried matched the keys and he started the car and took off. This was just the start of a series of incredible escapes Richard pulled off. However, just a few more blocks later, the old Lincoln ground to a halt and again Richard ran. This time to an apartment building he knew had a vacant room. He broke in and planned to lie low for a bit but he was spotted and in no time the police surrounded the place. But Richard was determined to evade them and he climbed out of the third floor window, grabbing a tree to break his fall. But things didn't go to plan and he dropped faster than he thought, missing the tree and plunging to the ground where he was quickly apprehended. Richard was injured and was lucky to have survived. After he was released from the hospital, he was moved to the Ward County Jail and in February 1988, sheriff's deputies discovered another escape attempt, when after moving Richard to another cell, they found two cinder blocks partially chiseled out from the cell in which he was being held. Eventually, Richard was charged with several burglaries, the murder of Jerry and the attempted murder of Kitzman. He pleaded guilty to the shootings, and in doing so received a slightly reduced sentence of between 25 and 35 years. On the 22nd of July 1988, Richard was driven from Minot to North Dakota State Penitentiary to start his sentence. When he reached the prison, he was immediately put in segregation, as he was considered to be a prisoner who would try to escape and possibly kill again. And they were right on the former. Richard's thoughts, as soon as he arrived, were how could he escape?
Richard soon settled into prison life and was given work. He was respected by both the inmates and the officers, and he gave lectures to school kids as part of a crime prevention scheme. He also wrote for the prison Inside Times newspaper. Richard wasn't a problem prisoner, and he had regular visits from his family and his girlfriend, although eventually their relationship ended. But he was getting fed up with seeing inmates freed on parole and grew resentful that he would not be eligible for many years. So he decided the only way to freedom was to break out. He planned his escape with Rondel Heisch, who was known as Kicker. Kicker was a guy you didn't mess with. He was also a computer expert. The pair volunteered to work overtime at the Rough Riders Industries, a workshop where prisoners made various items, including dumpsters, highway signs, and furniture. They knew there was a huge exhaust vent that ran through the workshop and exited to the outside. And that was how they planned to escape. During their work hours, Kicker would keep watch as Richard crawled into the vent to dismantle the security hardware, and eventually they got hold of a plasma cutter, as the first cutter they used wasn't powerful enough. Richard managed to cut a path through, and the pair planned their escape for Monday morning. However, Richard made the mistake of bringing someone else in on the plan, and word got around. Before long, the police were called, and Richard and Kicker were busted. As punishment, they both had time added to their sentences, and spent time in segregation. Despite his failed first attempt, Richard was determined to try a second breakout, and just months after, he started planning how he was going to do it. Richard was back to his old prison job, working on the newspaper, and he wrote about and took pictures of the new education building that was being built. After watching its construction, it gave him an idea. He could see there was going to be a large space between the drop ceiling and the roof. The reason for the space was to allow access to air conditioning units. But Richard figured if he could get into the space and find a vent, he could kick out the cover and be out of the building. Kicker was also in on the scheme, but they were careful not to let anyone else in on their plan. However, they made the same mistake again. When the night before they planned to escape, they let a fellow con, Rick Holland, in on the plan. Holland was a former army ranger who they figured would be useful in helping them once they got over the perimeter fence. The new educational block had a TV and VCR for prisoners to watch movies. On the evening of Friday the 9th of October 1992, Richard selected a movie he knew no prisoners would want to watch. It was a biblical saga, The Ten Commandments. The three men closed the blinds and settled down to watch the film. They then crawled through an exhaust vent in the ceiling into the crawl space, where Kicker worked on the paddock that secured an access hatch to the roof. But Richard and Holland had found an easier route out through an air conditioning vent. All three men crawled through and were in the prison grounds. This was known as the kill zone to an escapee, as if they were spotted by security, they would be shot on sight. As the men tentatively made their way to the perimeter fence, they were spotted by a female officer who had been investigating after hearing footsteps in the roof. But luckily for them, she was unarmed, and by the time she alerted security, the three men were over the fence and free. All hell broke loose in the prison as the guards tried to figure out who had broken out, and outside the sirens could be heard all around. The three men had split up, and it was every man for himself. Within hours, Holland, who had hurt his ankle, was recaptured. Kicker had stolen a pickup truck, but he didn't get far when he was recognized by a passerby and the cops closed in on him. But Richard, he eluded capture. He stole a car and headed to South Dakota. Richard moved from place to place in stolen cars. He grew his hair and dyed it blonde in an attempt to disguise himself. He found odd bits of work, and even worked as a racehorse walker. At one point, he managed to visit his hometown of Duncan. But after 10 months of freedom, Richard was eventually apprehended in Grand Island, Nebraska, on the 5th of July, 1993, after he broke into a car dealership office. Richard was sent back to segregation at North Dakota State Penitentiary, but was eventually transferred to Minnesota Correctional Facility, Oak Park Heights a place that prided itself on never having an escapee.
After a number of years in Oak Park Heights, Richard realized he would not be able to escape, so he participated in a sit-down strike that caused his return to North Dakota, and eventually he was assigned to the maximum security, United States Penitentiary, Florence High. Again, Richard realized that escape would be unlikely, so he arranged a transfer to United States Penitentiary, Pollock, on the grounds that it was marginally closer to his family home in Oklahoma. In reality, he thought it would be easier for him to escape from. Richard's job at Pollock was to repair mailbags for the US Postal Service. Richard stood out at the prison. He was the most unlikely inmate. He was polite, didn't drink or do drugs, and was not part of any gangs or allegiances with other prisoners. With no tattoos or piercings, he looked far from the typical inmate held in the high security prison. He was also in excellent shape. However, despite appearances, he still came with a reputation, and that was as an escape artist. At 7.20 a.m. on April 2006, Richard arrived as normal at his work area. After being searched, he put on his work gear to start work. All his movements that day were caught on a security camera. As he made his way to the corner of the factory, he realized the day that he had planned for, for months, was finally here. Richard knew an unrepaired pallet of old mailbags was due to be sent out of the prison, and in the weeks prior, he had built a pallet with a hide spot in it. He made it big enough for him and the supplies he had been storing up. Richard constructed the pod using metal poles and zip ties he took from the mailbags. To utilize the space, he intended to duct tape some of the supplies to his body. He had thought of everything from food and clothing to personal items and a map. The pallets were shrink wrapped before they were taken back to the warehouse and Richard even asked for the shrimp wrap to wrap his special load. When it was time to go, he used talcum powder to squeeze through the plastic wrap and settle into his pod in the middle of the sacks. Nobody saw him get into the pod and the pallet with Richard inside was loaded onto a flatbed lorry. By around 9 a.m. that morning, Richard was on his way out to the prison gates. It wasn't all plain sailing though. The heat that day was sweltering and Richard was entombed in a pile of stinking mailbags wrapped in plastic. There was little air and no room to move. He couldn't even wipe the sweat that was pouring into his eyes. Breathing was difficult, but Richard had thought of that and had made a snorkel out of rigid cardboard that gave him a limited air supply. The tube saved his life, as without it, he would have likely suffocated. The penitentiary warehouse was just beyond the prison gates. As the truck pulled out of the factory en route to the warehouse, it should have been searched, but Richard knew that wouldn't happen, and it didn't. He did, however, have a scare at the gate. When an officer thought his pallet looked a bit off, and thought it should be put in quarantine for 24 hours, as was the rules. But luckily, the officials came to some agreement and the truck went on its way. The truck reached its destination and the pallets, including Richard's, were forklifted into the warehouse. Richard knew it was about the time staff went on their lunch and this is when Richard made his move. As he cut himself out of the pod using a homemade razor blade knife, he had no idea where he was. Luckily, he found himself in an open warehouse outside of the prison grounds. As he stepped outside into the air, he was free in one of the most audacious prison escapes ever. Richard was the first prisoner in US history to escape from UPS Pollock, and the first prisoner in 13 years to break out of a federal state penitentiary. The game of cat and mouse was about to begin. Hours after his escape, McNair was stopped near Ball, Louisiana, by police officer Carl Bordelon. The incident was captured on a video camera mounted in Bordelon's patrol car. Take a look. You, you live around here, bud? No. Where you live at? Down the road by uh, Pineville. What's your name? Robert Jones. Robert Jones? Uh-huh. What is? We got an escapee. Oh, <laughs> Where from? Uh, prison. There's a prison here? Yeah. Huh. Man, it is hot. Hey, this is Carl. The subject wore glasses. What about? Take your glove off. Yeah. Uh, 
Any tattoos or anything? Flip oh. it over. No, no, I'm just. No, nah, he's clean. I'm oh, 50 years old. <laughs> how old is your guy? You're how old? 50. I was born in 56. He was born in 56. Okay. All right, let me uh, let me just verify. He says his brother's staying at the motel. Let me verify that, and if so, I'll just cut him loose. All right, thanks. I guarantee I'm not no You know the bad thing about it? What's that? You're matching up to him. <laughs> well, that sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, what are you staying at? That uh, Titusville or Titus Inn? Titus Inn, a little old. Little old. Uh, Where's that at? I don't even know the address. We just got into town about a week ago, and he dropped me off to jog. I always jog about 12 miles a day. Where'd he drop you off at? Up there on that road by, uh, there's some construction going on up there, an house. Uh -huh. And he dropped me off, and uh, he'll be back to the hotel in about probably 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Who y'all work for? It's his, it's his, uh... I know, what's the name Brooklyn of the company? company? Phil's Roofing. Okay. Phil's Roofing. Did you go through a briar patch or something? Well, yeah, roofing. I always roof in shorts and cut my uh, scratching up on, you know, the roof. That's stuff. why your knees are all cut up? Yeah. Or y'all got pads? Huh? Y'all wear pads? They are too hot. They rub your, the pads rub your back of your legs and stuff. Um, where are you from? Huh? We're originally Dallas, Texas. I mean, that's where y'all yeah, stay where at? we're out of. Out of Dallas, Texas? Yeah. What's your name again? Jimmy Jones. Uh, put yourself in my position. Well, yeah, but I'm not. <laughs> I know I'm not. Man. I'm not. I'm not you throwing you against her. Hey, you wouldn't believe what them guys do. Okay. I mean, they got years and years to think about how they're gonna do it. Now, uh, when I crossed the tracks down there, I saw you running. I said, "Well, how lucky can I be?" <laughs> um, I promise you, I'm not no damn Chris and escaping. You'd have done run by now. <laughs> <laughs> you know that yourself. <laughs> yeah. You'd have done run by now. No. Yeah, just be careful. You'll probably get stopped again, okay? okay. Don't don't be alarmed by it. Border, 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 border line. line, yeah. Okay, and you'll be on till well, this shift. I'll be on till we find this on the gun. Well, my dad's an auxiliary detective. In Where Dallas, at? In Dallas. They got oh, okay. The possum is what they call it. Yeah. He's 70 years old and he's been doing it since 63. Still he's enjoys it. Else, yeah. But um, if, I, if somebody else stops me, I just have not call. I mean, they're going to go through the same spill okay. and everything well, with you. They can you. call you. But, um, yeah, I mean, don't be alarmed by it. Don't be okay. upset about it. You know, they'll just stop you for a minute, check you out and everything. But if you do jog again in the future, carry some ID with you. See, I don't... In, I'm sorry. When I was in the military, we never carried our ID yeah. on base and stuff. So. Our base is different. Yeah, I know. You know, they assure you if you can cross on, you, you got something. Yep. But out here, you're in civilian life, you know. Were you in the military? No, I wasn't. I'm retired Army. But, um, yeah, in the future, if you're going to jog again, that way, I mean, if you get run over by a train, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to start second-guessing who he is, you can know. Can you write down your uh, phone number, your cell phone number, so I can have whoever call you? Just call. You got a cell phone with you? No, hell no. I don't even have a cell phone or anything. Just call 911 is all you got to do, and they'll get a hold to us. All right. That's hey, our quick line there. You have a good day now. Be careful, buddy. Thank you. All right. One factor that made it easier for Richard to escape arrest was that the photo of him provided to police was very low quality and six months old. Another was that the prison had told police that they were not completely sure that Richard had escaped. Borderland later claimed that he let Richard go because the physical description of him given to the police was completely different from how McNair actually appeared. On April 13th, 2006, US Marshals added McNair to their 15 most wanted list. It also described the distinctive scar on his left hand. Late that April, about two weeks after his escape, Richard successfully crossed into British Columbia from Blaine, Washington. On April 28, 2006, Richard had another lucky escape when he was stopped by police in Penticton, British Columbia investigating a stolen car that he was driving, which was parked at a local beach. The officers asked Richard to step out of the car to be questioned, which he did, but then made a run for it. 
The police impounded the car, but did not realize the identity of Richard until two days later, when one of the officers recognized him from an episode of America's Most Wanted. Further examination of the car revealed a digital camera full of self-portraits, which police determined were probably for the purpose of producing a fake ID. His fingerprints were also discovered. In May 2006, McNair traveled back to the United States in a stolen Subaru Eggback. He proceeded to travel across the United States and eventually crossed back into Canada from Minnesota and made his way to Vancouver. In 2007, Richard traveled to Eastern Canada and spent about two months in Fredericton, New Brunswick, before he was again confronted by police. The publicity generated by America's Most Wanted meant it got harder and harder to escape the police and the public. Richard later said that the show was a thorn and that whenever a new episode aired, he would buy food and fuel his vehicle in case he was featured. Richard followed intently through newspapers and the internet the hunt for him and was surprised at how much media coverage he was getting. In order to support himself, Richard stole vehicles and cash from car dealerships. Because he had once worked as a car salesman himself, he knew where to find cash and keys at such dealerships and how to avoid security. He stole only new vehicles since they had window stickers indicating whether a vehicle was equipped with a GPS style tracking system. If it was, he wouldn't touch it. But life as a fugitive was not easy and his time was about to run out. On October 24, 2007, near Nash Creek, New Brunswick, an off-duty RCMP constable noticed an expensive looking white van with badly tinted rear windows and an Ontario license plate. Suspecting that the van was stolen or being used for smuggling, he reported the plate number and that the van was heading to the city of Camp Balton. His report alerted other RCMP in Camp Balton and the next day, Constable Stefan Gagnon a six-week rookie spotted Richard's van by chance and pursued it. Following a low-speed car chase and a subsequent foot chase, Gagnon successfully arrested Richard with the help of his field coach. All right, Constable, first let me ask you, did he try any of this smooth talking when you all pulled him over? Well, uh, it all started, we, we attempted to initiate a traffic stop, but uh, he fled from us and he, uh, he ended up, uh, he bailed on foot going into the forest. Did you know how serious a criminal he was and what a serious escape risk he was at the time? No, at the time we had no idea why he was fleeing from us. We only wanted to uh, perform a traffic stop on this uh, Ontario plate van and uh, he took us for a, a six kilometers pursuit and he ended up in a dead end where he parked the vehicle in a gravel road which we later found as soon as he saw us there he, uh, he bailed on foot towards the forest and uh, we kind of split in the forest uh, my partner constable Gagnon and I split and we had corporal Fauré going um, westbound after his arrest, Richard was transferred to the Atlantic Institution, a Canadian Federal Maximum Security Penitentiary in New Brunswick, whilst he waited extradition to the United States. Apparently, Richard did not resist arrest and was quite jovial with the officers. Richard is currently incarcerated at ADX Florence, a supermax prison near Florence, Colorado. ADX Florence has a reputation as the Alcatraz of the Rockies. It houses some of the United States' most dangerous prisoners who have been deemed too great a security risk for even a maximum security prison. Richard himself has been quoted as saying, he is incarcerated in the most secure section of the most secure prison in the world, but thank God for prisons. There are some very sick people in here animals you would never want living near your family or the public in general. I don't know how corrections staff deal with it. They get spat on, abused, and I've seen them risk their own lives and save a prisoner many times. Although Richard's audacious escapes have made him a household name in both the US and Canada, ultimately his escapes mean he will likely spend the rest of his life at ADX Florence. He is imprisoned in a 12 by seven foot concrete cell with little access to the outside world. All his incoming and outgoing mail is screened in case he is planning another escape. 
Despite this, Richard has been able to build up a relationship with Canadian journalist Byron Christopher, and through hundreds of prison correspondence with him, he wrote the excellent book, The Man Who Mailed Himself Out of Jail, in which he gives a detailed insight into Richard's life, crimes, and time on the run. If you read the book, you can't help thinking Richard could have made so much more of his life. He is described as an intelligent, likeable, and kind man, with no real reason to start a life of crime. But by killing an innocent man, no matter how likeable he is, or how ingenious his escape bids were, he does deserve to be where he is today. All four of the McNair boys had the same upbringing. They all got an education and jobs. Three of them got wives and started families of their own. It was only Richard that ended up in prison. So that's it for this video. We hope you've enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.